As someone who primarily teaches courses about the ancient world, I had always thought that World War II was a much simpler issue to teach and that students would be able to take it on pretty easily. But then I actually saw what it was like to teach something like Western Civ II or a basic survey of America or modern Europe. And what I realized is that due to the time compression of these massive surveys, it's very difficult to effectively convey how things fit together when it came to what caused World War II. So what I'm going to do in this video is hopefully make up for that deficit and supply a relatively brief but also reasonably thorough lay of the land when it comes to how to conduct a causal analysis and try to get at why World War II occurred. This video is designed primarily for undergraduate level students who are not history majors, but who want to make sure that they grasp the subject and are prepared for exams and papers on the subject. I would like to begin by exploring what I see as common mistakes in both the way that this material is taught when it is taught quickly and also some common misperceptions that students form based on going through this material rapidly and then being asked to respond to it after only a short period of exposure. One common mistake in the way that this material is presented in a number of textbooks is that the account focuses far too heavily on what is going on in the US and in Germany during the interwar years at the expense of all of the other players. The player which gets ignored the most, by a long shot it seems to me, is Japan. As I'll show in this video, Japan's path to war was almost entirely separate from the path to war that we see in Europe. The Treaty of Versailles was an important cause of World War II, we'll get into it in a little while, but because it is listed with the Great Depression as one of the major causes of World War II, a lot of students for some reason make the assumption that the Treaty of Versailles caused the Great Depression, but that is not the case. Um, I think the reason they get that impression is because um, the effects of the Great Depression were enhanced by the um, way that the Treaty of Versailles punished Germany by making them pay reparations. However, that did not cause a global economic collapse in of itself. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. One thing that the Great Depression did do, which we'll also explore in more detail, is to enable radical political actors in a number of countries, including the US and Germany, but also pretty much every major nation involved in World War II. However, one thing that people are also prone to do is to look at certain political outcomes, such as the rise of Hitler, as being inevitable. But I will argue in this video that without the combination of German resentment due to the Treaty of Versailles and then the desperation created by the Great Depression, the rise of someone like a Hitler would be far more unlikely, and that would have changed history dramatically. So let's now get into more specific things that we've laid out some of the basic premises of this video. While the primary place to look for context for World War II is in World War I and the events between the wars, some of the issues which helped to drive World War II actually date back a lot farther. The first example is anti-Semitism, the thing that Hitler rode to power, more or less. Anti-Semitism dates back all the way to the Roman Empire. This was nothing new. One dramatic flare-up prior to the Holocaust was actually all the way back in 1096 during the First Crusade when the Rhineland massacres occurred as zealous crusaders decided to warm up by killing local Jews while they were marching to the Middle East. As for the rivalry between France and Germany, which had featured so prominently in World War I, that actually dates back to 1870 when Prussia invaded France winning a victory and then setting the stage for the official formation of Germany under the leadership of Otto von Bismarck. Both countries had a strong claim to the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, and that was at the center of their beef with one another. And that, of course, also dated back to 1870. One factor to keep in mind is that from the early 19th century forward, technology was becoming increasingly vital to military success. 
Technology was also becoming a lot more uneven, however, due to uneven industrialization. What this means is that some countries simply could not compete on the battlefield with others, and so diplomatic options for creating a balance of power were becoming increasingly constrained. You simply couldn't add a country and count its military strength simply by the number of rifles it could put in the field. If a country cannot produce things like tanks, modern aircraft, or modern warships, its military value is significantly lower. Turkey, in theory, should have been a relatively major player in the World War II period, but the Turkish army did not have modern equipment and was completely irrelevant. Another thing to keep in mind is that Japan was the only power in the Pacific with a modern military or with more than a nominal industrial capacity. If we want to understand both the rise of people like Hitler who helped to drive the war and also the actions of the countries who could have stopped him, Britain and France being the two that come to mind, we really have to examine how World War I ended and the mindset of all of the leaders involved. The Russian Revolution really transformed the way that pretty much all Western powers viewed the world. In 1917, in the middle of World War I, the Bolsheviks and others rose up against the Tsar, and in a six-year civil war, they managed to overthrow the Tsar, defeat the so-called whites. Those are basically just a coalition of conservative groups in Russia who were not in favor of communism. And at the end of the war, they established the Soviet Union. At various times, the U.S., Britain, and France all provided military assistance to the whites, and of course, they chose the losing side. What this means is that not only does the new USSR find itself a pariah on the international scene, but it too feels that it has been wronged. And because the Western powers know that the USSR is unhappy with them, they now have fears of communist uprisings in their own countries. This means that their focus will be heavily on preventing other communist uprisings from occurring, and this will also mean that even when they view other radical movements, say the fascist, they will view them from the lens of at least this movement is not communist. Japanese troops also intervened in Russia, trying to grab land in Siberia from 1920 to 1922, and they only withdrew their forces after British and American diplomatic pressure. So effectively, Russia was seen as the world's new boogeyman following the fall of the Second Reich, the Germany of the Kaiser. In 1918, as Germany was in the midst of losing the war, the German Revolution broke out. This effectively started out as a mutiny when the Navy refused to sail out to challenge the British fleet again, and then spread across society. People demanded that the war be brought to an end, and they were tired of the fighting. This culminated in the so-called Spartacist uprising of January 1919, which was a general strike in Berlin by a Bolshevik-style communist party. And while this uprising lasted for perhaps a week, this was never a major threat. And as far as general strikes go, it was quite unsuccessful since it did not shut down the city. Due to the extreme fear of Bolshevism inspired by what had occurred in Russia, what was ongoing in Russia actually, um, many elements of society banded together to put this down brutally. After the Spartacist uprising, the German SPD, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, made peace with more conservative elements and they agreed to form the new Weimar Republic and to make peace officially with the Allies. From the outset, the Treaty of Versailles was controversial. One of the articles of the Treaty of Versailles was Article 231, the so-called War Guilt Clause, where Germany had to agree to take responsibility for starting the war, and because of their confession of guilt, they would then be required to pay war reparations to the victorious allies, mostly Britain, Belgium, and France. Now, for the Allies, this was not so much about assigning blame as getting the money. However, for the Germans, this was both a financial imposition and a major attack on their pride uh, 
and their sense of, you know, that they had not been solely responsible for the war. If you're familiar with the outbreak of World War One, it's very clear that assigning blame is not exactly easy if you had to find a single culprit. The reparations do, by the way, amounted to 132 billion Deutschmarks, or to put it in modern terms, that would be 442 billion American dollars as of 2019. Germany was forced to limit its army going forward to only 100,000 men, most of whom would have to be foot infantry because the numbers of their advanced war machines were strictly limited, and by advanced war machines I mean aircraft and tanks primarily. And Germany also lost 25,000 square miles of territory and 7 million inhabitants. Among the lost possessions were some of the ones that France wanted. Poland also gained part of the East, the newly formed nation of Poland, I mean. German officials were deeply upset about these terms, as were the people of Germany. However, the German military advised that it was in no capacity to fight against a renewed Allied assault, and so German officials had no option but to sign the Treaty of Versailles and accept the payment of reparations. The United States had entered World War I late, and President Woodrow Wilson had become one of the major shapers of the peace. Unfortunately, he was not able to prevent the War Guilt Clause from being worked into the Treaty of Versailles. He had correctly observed that it would most likely just spark resentment and possibly lead to a round two of World War I. Another thing that he had going against him is that while all of this was going on, he happened to suffer a semi-debilitating stroke, and that very much compromised his effectiveness. Um, and around the same time, the American public had grown weary of foreign adventures. Having tasted a little bit of what it was like to be in World War I with trench warfare and the astonishing casualty rates of modern battles, the American public thought that it was wise to leave the old world to its own devices and look out for interest back home. This led to the election of both a Republican Senate and a Republican president, Warren G. Harding. In 1920, he ran on a platform of a return to normalcy, normalcy being his botched attempt to say normality, but it sounded so right that it became a recognized and real word. This policy of normalcy included demobilization and isolationism, something that would hold fast in America all the way until America's entry into World War II in 1941. Harding and the Senate Republicans rejected membership in the League of Nations that Woodrow Wilson had advocated, and this meant that the League was effectively deprived of the most powerful and stable nation in the world. By this point, due to the combination of natural resources, population, and industrial capacity, the U.S. was clearly the strongest country in the world, even if it wasn't necessarily the largest. It couldn't compete for size with, say, the Soviet Union or Britain or France because of their empires, but in terms of actual strength, it was pretty clear by this point that the U.S. was uh, far above the others. So without the most powerful nation in the world, you can imagine that the stability of a peacekeeping organization was quite compromised from the outset. While the League of Nations was the brainchild of Woodrow Wilson, neither he nor the United States would end up being involved in its operation. This body was supposed to adjudicate international disputes and prevent another massive war. However, it would quickly prove to be ineffective and fundamentally flawed. The League lacked any sort of st central structure, and there also was no combined force that existed outside of the member states. The League, in other words, was more of a meeting place than a physical institution with its own prerogatives. In the absence of a League army of some kind, the four members of the Executive Council, Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, were responsible for all enforcement activities on their own and under their own banners. This, of course, would require all of them to work in concert at all times, which was quite unlikely. And 
The real problem with it was shown very early on. Mussolini rose to power in Italy in 1922, and he quickly began to engage in foreign aggression. But none of the other major powers were willing to stand up to him. And what this showed at an early date is that this institution was completely ineffective at governing larger powers. The only thing it could do at its best was to adjudicate disputes between minor powers, something that major powers were already capable of without the League of Nations in the first place. The League of Nations had a number of responsibilities, not least of which was enforcing the Treaty of Versailles and preventing Germany from rising up again. Without America's involvement, the League had no real chance of success. During the 20s, when the Allied countries still had money, they were fairly strict about enforcing the Treaty of Versailles. France and Britain owned sprawling empires, however, and this meant that they had no moral authority to oppose the imperialist ambitions of Italy and Japan, their erstwhile colleagues on the Executive Council of the League of Nations. And because they could not and would not oppose these other countries from engaging in imperialism, small countries began to lose faith in British and French leadership and authority. The League's leaders were very selective with their sanctions and interventions, seeking their own interest first and foremost, and anything else as simply a bonus. The primary goal of Britain and France was not to prevent Mussolini from carving out an empire in Africa, but rather simply preventing German rearmament. And to prove exactly how serious they were about that, France and Belgium actually occupied the Ruhr Valley between 1923 and 1925 due to defaults on reparation payments. This is something that the League sanctioned since it was a part of the treaty. However, other acts of aggression abroad went unpunished. In Germany, the Weimar Republic began to operate. It was a liberal democracy not unlike those of Britain and France at the time. However, the atmosphere of defeat and economic struggle meant that political radicalism and strife were quite common, whereas in most of Europe outside of Germany and Russia, things were relatively stable-ish in the 1920s. Despite the pressure of reparations payments, Weimar was able to provide social benefits to the most vulnerable citizens. So, it was a representative government. People got what they voted for to some extent or other. Government under von Hindenburg, one of Germany's World War I heroes, tried its best to limit radical factions through the use of the army as a police force, and the radical factions that von Hindenburg attempted to limit included the Nazis. However, since the Nazis were so effective at stirring up resentment and playing into resentment, they steadily grew throughout the 20s under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, an Austrian World War I veteran. Meanwhile, in Italy, a fascist party led by Benito Mussolini would rise to power. Mussolini, and not Hitler, was the inventor of fascism. The idea behind fascism is that Mussolini was going to restore the glory of the Roman Empire to Italy. A fascist is a bundle of sticks that Roman authorities would carry as a symbol of their authority, hence the name fascist. This party, surprisingly, was originally funded by the British Intelligence Service MI5 in order to try to act as a countervailing force against socialist and communist operating in Italy. Mussolini's fascist party, which evoked the image of Rome, unsurprisingly appealed to Italian nationalism and it was largely ignored as a threat both at home and abroad because it was not communist. Keep in mind that this is while the Bolshevik Revolution is still ongoing. The fascist marched on Rome in 1922, and King Victor Emmanuel, in his panic, appointed Mussolini as prime minister to allay tensions and prevent violence. It's also possible that the fascists who marched on Rome were not actually planning violence and that Victor Emmanuel panicked and jumped the gun, but at any rate, this put Mussolini in power as prime minister, and he quickly moved to end Italy's democracy and set up a totalitarian government. In 
The most significant thing about Mussolini's reign in Italy for the cause of World War II is that Mussolini was an expansionist and he dreamed of Roman glory and moved quickly to try to achieve it. His foreign policy looked to create an empire in the Balkans and in Africa while also remaining equidistant, as he termed it, from the major powers, politically speaking, so that Italy, when it joined with one faction or another, would tip the scales in favor of one faction or the other. This is, of course, dependent on Italy being one of the major players, but as we'll see, Mussolini's pursuit of empire would greatly weaken Italy prior to World War II, and its joining with Germany would end up not being that big of an event in the war. Mussolini, as I mentioned earlier, was the first to challenge the League of Nations legitimacy, and he did so through his actions in North Africa. During the 1920s, Italy conquered Libya and Eritrea, but quickly found that overrunning these areas was far easier than governing them, as they faced a long-lived and stiff resistance in both countries. By the early 1930s, since Italy had combat experience and it had been spending on its military, it was widely believed to have the most advanced army in the world. Its equipment in relative terms was better than that fielded by other armies. However, Italy would squander their military advantages by pulling all of the resources into Ethiopia. The so-called Abyssinian crisis is when Italy invaded and conquered Ethiopia in 1935 to the outrage of the global community. However, the two leaders in the League of Nations who might be expected to speak up against Mussolini, Britain and France, instead decided that a more worthwhile objective was to try to keep Mussolini away from Hitler, so they tried to win his friendship by offering to recognize Italian rule in Ethiopia and just ignore his aggression in that region. Of course, as we all know, this was not successful and Mussolini still ended up in Hitler's orbit anyway. All Britain and France ended up achieving in this event was to further undermine the legitimacy of the League of Nations in the eyes of many of its constituent members. In the Pacific, Japan followed a far different trajectory than the European powers when it came to how it got to World War II. Japan's ascent to power and path to World War II actually starts around 1854. Up to that time, Japan had been a feudalistic, medieval-style country governed by the Tokugawa shogunate. Things changed in 1854, however, when Commodore Perry of the United States arrived with ships of war and demanded that Japan open its ports to foreign trade. Japan had absolutely no way to resist a modern military, and they were forced to do what the U.S. demanded. In 1868, recognizing that Japan had to modernize or be overrun by foreign powers, the Meiji Restoration broke out, and this was effectively a revolution against the Tokugawa shogunate, and this led to the restoration of the powers of the emperor, who had largely been a figurehead before that point, and a thorough program of westernization across the board, from clothing to uh, military arrangements to you name it. Japan now formed a modern army and fleet, and this protected them from any further western imperialism. However, once they developed this army and navy, Japan abandoned its historical isolationism and began to embark on imperial ventures of its own. One reason for this is simply because Japan is not a resource-rich nation and modernized industrial nations require a great deal of natural resources to continue to grow and function. Japan first announced its modernity on the international scene when it won a smashing victory over China in the Sino-Japanese War from 1894 to 1895. This was mostly fought in Korea. But the thing that really stunned the world and let them know that Japan was not to be trifled with was when the Japanese won a crushing victory over Russia in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905. This involved the Japanese fleet effectively sinking almost an entire squadron of the Russian Navy. Something that, by the way, also helped to destabilize Russia and undermine the Tsar's credibility. 
Prior to World War I, Japan had achieved hegemony in Korea and Taiwan, and all this did was to fuel the desire for more empire. It joined the Allied powers in World War I, largely in order to claim Germany's holdings in China. Otherwise, what interest would Japan have had in a European war? This, of course, gave them some claim to being one of the victorious powers, and this gave them their seat in the League of Nations. Japan grew in power and in population during this general period. Its population at least doubled between 1873 and 1935, and some estimates even say that it may have tripled. The Japanese economy also grew steadily until the Great Depression when Japan's economy slowed down considerably. By the 1930s, what we see is that a liberal democratic faction got beaten out by an imperialist faction, which was bent on the conquest of Asia. This imperialist faction was both modernist in its outlook, but also maintained the kind of um, samurai warrior um, mentality. And this would become increasingly dominant as the war in the East would go on. In 1931, the Japanese began um, what was World War II for them, ultimately, by invading Manchuria. When Japan invaded Manchuria and the League of Nations did nothing, Japan actually ended up leaving when Britain and France protested. This gave a green light to fascists in Europe who dreamt of conquest at the expense of their neighbors in Europe. Also for Japan, their conflict in China was separate up until 1939, but once Japan and Britain started tangling, this is what really made these two separate conflicts, the one in Europe and the one in Asia, part of the same general conflict, World War II. You can make an argument, therefore, that we should say that the beginning of World War II is actually 1931 rather than 1939. Speaking of the Great Depression, this is the overall umbrella term for the economic downturn that characterized the 1930s. In 1929, the American stock market collapsed, and in the next couple of years, the banking sector and pretty much every other sector of the American economy collapsed as well. America had been shoring up the Weimar Republic through loans, and when President Hoover recalled those loans, the German economy, which was already puttering along at best, also collapsed. Um, without American investment and American consumption and production, the global economy as a whole slowed down dramatically. However, the Depression did not have a uniform impact on the world. Different countries were affected to different extents. France, for instance, which largely has a decentralized economy, was not nearly as impacted as the U.S. or Germany. And not surprisingly, French politics did not radicalize as much as the politics of Germany. What happened in a lot of the westernized countries is that traditional free market economic solutions were implemented and these solutions, which had become orthodoxy during the 1920s, failed in spectacular fashion to end the crisis. This undermined the support for traditional politics and existing parties and helped to produce an atmosphere conducive to the rise of communist and fascist parties across the world, especially in places that were highly affected. The reason why the depression was not cured by any of these solutions that the governments in power tried to put forward is largely because it was a perfect storm of different sectors all being too weak to generate growth in other sectors and therefore in the cycle. Previous boom-bust cycles had been ended because one sector would remain strong and have the capital to invest in others and regenerate growth. In this case, however, there was no way for the market to fix itself since things had gone badly off the rails and the policies of Herbert Hoover and his counterparts in Europe were not going to work. What we also see is that different regimes will rise to power and try to combat the depression as best they can. But despite producing a variety of cures, including FDR's New Deal, nothing actually succeeded in ending the Depression. Success politically during the Depression era was alleviating suffering and trying to provide some degree of stability and hope for people. 
And in that, in that, um, from that perspective, I think it's safe to say that the greatest leader of the new of the uh, Great Depression era, without a doubt, was the American president Franklin Delano Roosevelt, since he prevented a radical revolution and was able to keep the country relatively intact during the 1930s. So now that we've looked at the general principle of how economic suffering and extraordinarily high rates of unemployment, unemployment reached around 20 to 25 percent in the U.S and around 30% in Germany, how these things can heavily influence radicalism. Let's now look at what happened in the US and what happened in Germany. In the US, in the 1932 election, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president. He implemented the New Deal. The New Deal was kind of a hodgepodge of different left-leaning policies, which provided jobs programs, social benefits such as Social Security, and other things which help to alleviate suffering and create some economic opportunities and relief for people. This became wildly popular and created a democratic coalition which would hold power into the early 1970s. And FDR's New Deal would provide a great deal of prosperity, but it would provide that prosperity after World War II and not during the Depression era of the 1930s. FDR was able to effectively fob off not only American Nazi movements and communist movements, but more strictly speaking American threats such as Huey Long pictured here and Father Coughlin who both are hard to characterize simply, but Huey Long was something of a populist left guy and then Father Coughlin was something of a populist right guy. In Germany, Unemployment reached 30% by 1932, which happened to be the year Hitler was elected. And what this did was effectively destroy the legitimacy and support for the moderate parties, and it led to the rise of the Nazis and communists as the major players on the German political scene. Hitler managed to win the election in 1932, and he transformed the Weimar Republic into the Third Reich, focusing on lowering wages, so the idea being that you create more jobs when people get paid less for existing jobs. And he decided to rebuild the German military against the Treaty of Versailles in order to provide more jobs. These are effectively government jobs. So in a way, it is similar to FDR's uh, job program, except that Hitler is gearing up for war, whereas FDR was trying to build infrastructure and give power to the Tennessee Valley and things of that nature. So how did Germany end up being ruled by Adolf Hitler? Hitler's Nazi party had long appealed to German resentment over the Treaty of Versailles and to strong anti-Semitism and anti-communist feeling that was becoming more and more prevalent in Germany. A lot of Germans actually believed that their Jewish population had betrayed them during World War I and that's why they lost. In fact, many Germans felt that they had been betrayed by their leaders by bankers, by the Jews, by communists, by some other scapegoat, and that they had not lost the war fair and square. His message had a definite following in the 1920s. However, when things got worse in the 1930s, his party then really exploded and its popularity became mainstream. Hitler's political opponents also had a tendency to massively underrate him as a politician simply because he was not a Junker, one of the German nobility, and he was not particularly well educated in a formal sense. They also tended to underestimate the threat that he posed since he was on the right rather than a left-leaning person who might be a communist of some kind. Again, we can never underestimate the influence of the Russian Revolution on the political thinking of the leaders of the time. Anyone who was not a communist was not nearly as dangerous as anyone who was a communist. And there were no contexts which would make that not the case in the minds of people at the time. Hitler was elected prime minister in 1932. A lot of his political opponents assumed that he would make a clown of himself in office. And after he failed spectacularly, his Nazi party would be contained. However, what they didn't know is that Hitler was a ruthless opportunist and he would manufacture 
a crisis with the Reichstag fire in 1933 as an excuse to implement emergency measures and seize full control of the government, thus ending the Weimar Republic and beginning the Third Reich. As for international observers, they also made the mistake of underestimating Hitler as an effective agent, or they simply saw him as an asset simply because he was virulently anti-communist and they thought that at the bare minimum he would oppose the spread of Bolshevism. So we have to understand that Hitler's rise was in large part enabled by the existing assumptions of the time. Both the anti-Semitic and anti-communist feelings among many in Germany and the international anti-communist fears that were prevalent among the Western powers. Before we talk about why the Allies chose a course of appeasement in the 1930s rather than continuing the strict enforcement of Versailles as they had in the 1920s, we really have to consider the material conditions of the Allied powers. And we also have to consider that they thought they had an ally who turned out to not be a friend at all. As late as 1935, Benito Mussolini was also opposed to German rearmament. However, that same year when he invaded Ethiopia and began to suffer massive losses, he realized that Italy was not as well equipped for imperialistic ventures as he had hoped, and that if he truly wanted to fulfill his desire for Roman-style conquest, he would need a strong ally who would help him to conquer areas and give him some support. This led him to believe that his fellow fascist Adolf Hitler might make a great ally. It's important to keep in mind that because Mussolini came to power first and largely inspired Hitler, that Mussolini at this time thought that Hitler was something of his understudy or younger brother. And he thought that he would call the shots and be the senior partner. How wrong he was. When we look at France especially, we see that the French were quite right to fear the outbreak of another war. Every year, France would mobilize young men who came of age and train them. The classes before about 1936, that being men who came of age at 18, were of a certain size. But then when we get to about 1936 or 7, when we get to classes of men who came of age who would have been born during or slightly after World War I, what we see is that there is a massive demographic drop off in the number of men who come of age. And that is due to the absolute slaughter in the trenches, which disproportionately affected France. Now, other countries clearly lost millions of men in the war, but France's demographics were profoundly impacted by the war. So the French were well aware, painfully aware of their manpower shortages in comparison with all of the other potential combatants in a new war. And what this meant is that France was going to play it cautious because they knew that they absolutely could not fight another war like World War I. For them, the only logical course of action was to play it safe, try to avoid a war, and if they were forced to fight a war, to fight it in a casualty-friendly manner. This meant that France, when it began to retool its military in the late 30s, when it became clear that Hitler was becoming more aggressive, they invested rather in defensive fortifications more so than field forces. Their main investment was called the Maginot Line, and this was to protect their border with Germany. This was a heavily fortified area that would have been very difficult to attack head-on. The reason for investing in the Maginot Line is exactly because they feared that they had the manpower to fight Germany in a more head-to-head -head fashion the way that they had during World War I. As for Britain, it was not quite as poorly off as France, but it also had declined in power since World War I. The British Navy was still possibly the best in the world. Maybe the Japanese Navy was a bit better by this point, hard to say. Uh, the U.S. Navy was better in quality, and because of its massive industrial output, the U.S. Navy would quickly equip both once it entered the war. But uh, the problem with Britain is that its navy, while it was still great, it still had esprit de corps. It wasn't cutting edge anymore. 
That's not to say it was quite outdated, but its ships were no longer the best. And part of this is because Britain's industrial capacity was simply not equal to Germany or the USSR, which you could also say of France. And if you're wondering why I'm spending so much time talking about French preparedness for World War II, you have to remember that at this time, the USSR was still a pariah on the global stage. And if a conflict with Germany were to break out, the idea was that France would have to bear the brunt of the fighting, that most of the fighting would be fought in France by French troops. That is why when they were doing their war calculations uh, against Germany, Britain and France acted with such caution. They assumed that they would have to go it alone that it would be a two-on-one where the one, Germany, might actually be as powerful or more powerful than the two, Britain and France. In 1936, Spain erupted into a full civil war. The two warring sides in this conflict were the Republicans. This was the existing democratic government plus a left-leaning coalition, including communist, socialist, and others. On the other side were the nationalists. This was a right-leaning coalition ranging from fascist to conservative Catholics to monarchists to the normal array of right-wing groups led by General Francisco Franco. The war became an international concern for most powers in Europe and attracted a great deal of attention even in isolationist America. Franco was able to receive heavy aid from Hitler and Mussolini, who were his fellow fascist would-be dictators, and the Soviet Union, for its part, provided material assistance to the Republicans. Even Americans and British uh, leftists were able to get involved in this war, too. A few thousand Americans, including Ernest Hemingway, went to Spain in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. The war is effectively seen in the context of World War II as a dress rehearsal since what it solves the debut of many of the innovations that were made in the pre-war period. There were a number of important technological innovations between the wars, including vast advances in aircraft technology. Planes going into World War II were a great deal faster, more maneuverable. They had a higher payload and they also had greater range, which meant that they were capable of engaging in strategic bombing, something that had only really been a concept in World War I. One such strategic bombing was the German bombing of the city of Guernica, which was famously recorded by Pablo uh, Picasso in his painting here called Guernica. This is an abstract representation of the devastation that the bombing was able to inflict on a Spanish town. This also really aided in Hitler's rearmament effort since he had a reason to be calling up all of these troops, and he also was able to rotate men in and out of his Condor Legion in Spain in order to build the number of Germans who had combat experience. This was also the first time that Hitler was able to test Blitzkrieg, the new German style of war, which involved rapid movement by armored troops, uh, supported by air strikes and then followed up by infantry advances. And it turns out that Blitzkrieg was quite effective in Spain and would prove to be very effective in the early stages of World War II as well. At the same time that he was getting himself involved in Spanish politics, Adolf Hitler was growing increasingly aggressive closer to home as well. With a strong and confident military and a feckless and greatly weakened League of Nations, Italy and Japan had long since left the organization, Hitler began to embark on small conquest and other violations of the Treaty of Versailles. What he would do is episodically violate different parts of the peace at different moments to test the Allies without pushing them too far. He knew if he pushed them too hard too fast, they would declare war before he was ready. However, for the most part, the Allies were aware of what Hitler was doing, at least to some extent, and they too would begin to rearm, albeit at a slower pace, during the late 1930s. The Anschluss was one of the biggest territorial acquisitions that Hitler made. Hitler effectively intervened in Austrian internal uh, politics through a combination of funding the Austrian Nazis and threatening the Austrian government, 
in order to lead to the rise of an Austrian Nazi party in power and then allow that party to invite him in. What ended up happening is that Germany and Austria united as one nation, just Germany, in 1938. This was done on the grounds that they were all ethnic Germans. Hitler's Nazism was at heart extreme German nationalism, and this played right in with his message. Hitler also claimed other areas that happened to have a German majority population, including the Sudetenland, the German part of Czechoslovakia. For the most part, up until March of 1939, when he conquered the rest of Czechoslovakia, i.e. the Czech part, he adhered to this formula. From the Allies' perspective, since they were in no condition to fight, it made sense to take him at his word because if they were to fight, they feared they would lose. The word appeasement has developed a very negative connotation for obvious reasons. This was, broadly speaking, the policy of Neville Chamberlain of Great Britain and his French colleague Daladier. They thought that if they gave Hitler some concessions and effectively allowed him to undo the Treaty of Versailles, that he would content himself with acquiring German-speaking areas and then enjoy popularity in Germany and leave them alone. A lot of this misperception of Hitler was caused by a couple of different reasons. First and foremost is that the leaders and citizens in Britain and France feared another war. The experience of World War I had been quite scarring. Trench warfare had destroyed a generation, both literally and psychologically. And they also feared that they wouldn't win a war against Hitler. After efforts to prevent German rearmament had failed and after he had aligned himself with Mussolini, Allied leaders thought that their best course of action was to hope that he would be placated by these allocations of territory. At Munich in September of 1938, Neville Chamberlain met with Hitler and on his return to Britain, he announced proudly that he had achieved peace in our time a speech which was actually very well received at that moment. Neville Chamberlain was actually representing his people. The British people, as well as the French people, had no interest in going to war at that time. They thought that any alternative to war, even if it meant a renewed, powerful Germany, was better than fighting a war. While Neville Chamberlain is often seen as someone who was naive or unaware of Hitler's intentions, I think the truth is more that he thought he had struck a bargain and that when the war did break out at some point in the future, that Britain would be much better prepared to fight it. If you just think about how prepared each country was for war, Germany had been rearming for a few years now, and they were able to field a number of advanced uh, pieces of military hardware, and they also had a large number of men who were trained for war. They had the ME-109 fighter, for instance, which was one of the better fighters at that time. By contrast, if you look at Britain, they had just developed the Spitfire, and it was not available in large numbers. In France, their best fighter was the D-520, and it also was not available in large numbers. So that was just one thing they could look at and see that they were at a disadvantage uh, when compared to Germany. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, Britain simply did not have the bandwidth to seriously check the Japanese, and American public sentiment was completely isolationist at this time, since Japan had not, at that point, threatened any American interest directly. Um, if anything, the attention America did have when it came to foreign aggression was all focused on Europe, and I don't think it really occurred to anyone at the time that Japan was a serious threat to the United States. One question that often gets asked, and I believe is ultimately unanswerable, is whether or not World War II was inevitable. Was there a point of no return? I'm not sure, but I think that there may it may have actually been quite late if there was such a point. The Munich Agreement of September 1938 did not involve the Soviet Union or Czechoslovakia. Had it involved these two countries, which were both relevant for this discussion, 
Czechoslovakia because it was being carved up by Germany, and the Soviet Union because with Soviet involvement, this would create an actual threat to German expansion. Then the Munich Agreement possibly could have prevented the outbreak of World War II at least so soon after the agreement was made. However, having gotten what he wanted for free, Hitler decided by early 1939 that he should conquer some more stuff. In March of that year, he annexed the rest of Czechoslovakia. In May, Hitler and Mussolini formed the so-called Pact of Steel, where they agreed that they would go to war together against the Allies and that they would not make separate pieces. The Pact of Steel is really the point of no return. At that point, both fascist leaders in Europe, both major fascist leaders at least, resolved upon making war and were determined at all costs to defeat the Allies. Meanwhile, as we talked about with Japan, it had already invaded Manchuria in 1931, and its conflict with China and with the other powers of the Pacific would soon be rolled into the larger World War II once um, the war broke out in Europe. The four major causes that we've looked at here, the Treaty of Versailles, the Great Depression, appeasement, and the failure of the League of Nations, did not by themselves create World War II. However, when we look at these factors together and in combination, we see that they very much did produce World War II. The Treaty of Versailles helped to create the kind of resentment toward France and other victorious allied powers that allowed the initial rise of the Nazi party. When the Great Depression set in, this allowed the kind of desperation that would allow people to turn to something like fascism and not see it as too radical or outlandish. The reason why fascism was more successful in Italy, Spain, and Germany than communism, one of the other major responses to the Great Depression, is because of the kind of fear that the events of the Russian Revolution had instilled in many Western leaders. Japan's path to war was related to the path to war in Europe, but ultimately was driven by vastly different motives and experiences. However, we cannot ignore those motives and experiences since the Pacific Theater constituted a fairly large percentage of the total war. The Treaty of Versailles ultimately proved to be unenforceable with the League of Nations being so weak and with the United States absent from international diplomacy for so long. When it comes to the issue of appeasement, it by itself, although it is often just simply said as if it were a magical word which automatically explains how World War II got started, really is not an explanation by itself. We can only understand appeasement properly when we consider that the Allies first tried to enforce the Treaty of Versailles very strictly and to exact reparations, and then when the Depression hit, they found themselves unable to provide that kind of military intervention because they simply didn't have the funds available to fund uh, troop movements into Germany. As for American absence from the League of Nations, this was not simply the case that isolationism uh, undermined international security. It is very much the case, however, that the American public wanted nothing to do with such events. FDR was quite well aware of the danger posed by both Germany and Japan. However, he was only able to do so much because the public would have mutinied had he gotten America involved in this war. Um, believe it or not, the stance of Americans on foreign policy prior to World War II was decidedly isolationist. And it was very hard for someone, even FDR, who I think is without a doubt the greatest politician in American history, was not able to win that argument with the public. And that says a lot. And as for appeasement, to circle back to that in Europe, rather than condemning the proponents of appeasement as being weak, or weak need or short-sighted, we do have to remember that they represented liberal democracies, that they represented the interest of their people who were decidedly anti-war, 
and that they had to take an honest assessment of their ability to actually fight Hitler on the field of battle, and the assessment that they came up with was not a flattering one. They knew that they would have problems trying to face off against Hitler. They also had no way to know that they would ultimately be able to align themselves with the USSR and that the US would get involved as well. So hopefully this will help guide you as you try to put together the various pieces that constitute the puzzle that is World War II. I'm Thersites the Historian. Subscribe, like, share, and all of that other stuff that every YouTuber tells you to do.